I want to speak to you about Thanksgiving today and how that this is so important in the time of warfare, in the time of difficulty and pain, when you are under attack, when anxiety would like to take over you, you need to run to Thanksgiving. And uh, that's the title of this message, The Race to Thanksgiving. So would you open your Bibles with me to Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. And this is what it says. Daniel 6 verse 10 says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem three times a day. He got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks. Would you please say, giving thanks? Giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. And you know, because of it, he ended up in the lion's den. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do open up our hearts to you now, and we ask you to teach us and show us. Let your power and authority come. We speak it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want you to keep your finger there in Daniel chapter 6, but come with me to the book of Jeremiah. Uh, because in Jeremiah, we read about what happened, why Daniel is in Babylon, uh, why has the Jewish community now been brought into an Arab community, a, a, a Persian community, under the power of a wicked king. And so we read in Jeremiah chapter 52. It says in verse 4, So in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army. They camped outside the city and built siege works all around it. The city was kept under siege until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. So from the ninth year to the eleventh year, Jerusalem was under siege from King Nebuchadnezzar. And then we read in verse 24. This is after they captured the place, and it goes into detail before this on all the things from the temple that were removed. And in verse 24, the commander of the guard took as prisoner uh, Sariah, the chief priest, Zephaniah, the priest next in rank, and the three doorkeepers. Those are ushers. Uh, of those still in the city, he took the officer in charge of the fighting men and seven royal advisors. He also took the secretary, who was the chief officer in charge of conscripting the people of the land, and 60 of his men who were found in the city. And uh, this commander named uh, Zebu-Razadan, uh, the commander took them all and brought them to the king of Babylon in Rebla, there at Rebla, in the land of Hamath, that's Syria. The king had them executed. So Judah went into captivity, away from her land. This is the number of the people Nebuchadnezzar carried into exile. In the 70th year, 3,023 Jews. And then it goes on to tell you in different years, more Jews were taken into exile. And there were, it says at the end of verse 30, there were 4,600 people in all. The Jews were left in a ransacked, burned down city of Jerusalem in order to work the vineyards and work the fields in order that crops could be sent from Babylon or to Babylon. So even though they were not taken captivity, uh, the, they were kept there to, as slaves to work for Babylon. And Daniel was one of these men who was taken, as you know, from Jerusalem into Babylon as a prisoner. Uh, but Daniel was a man of God. And as we have just read, he heard what the decree was, that if anybody worshipped any other god but King Darius for a whole month, uh, they would be thrown into the lion's den and killed. And it says immediately upon hearing this, it says, 
It says in verse 10, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed and gave thanks as he had done before. Immediately upon hearing the death decree against him, he ran home to the quiet place. He had a special room allocated for prayer. He went to the prayer room in the upper story, opened the window. You know why he opened the window towards Jerusalem? Because when the temple was built in Jerusalem by King Solomon, King Solomon called upon the Lord God, and he said, God, if people have trouble, if our people have famine or wars or drought um, in this land, and uh, if we come to this temple and we pray, will you hear and will you protect us from our enemies and will you heal us from our diseases and will you watch over us and send rain for our land? And the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, if you pray in this place, I will hear your prayers. Even if you are in a faraway country and you look toward this place, he then said, if my people which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive them of their sins, and I will heal their land. So Daniel, this Jewish man, used to go up into the prayer room, open the window that looked out towards Jerusalem. And there, the Bible says, he gave thanks. You know, you have to understand that he wasn't just giving thanks because it was Christmas. He wasn't giving thanks because, you know, his wife just had a baby. He wasn't giving thanks uh, because he got his paycheck. He wasn't giving thanks because something good had happened in his life. Everything bad had happened in his life to his people, to every situation that he um, faced. Uh, it was there coming down upon him like an avalanche, like a storm. Uh, when it rains, it pours. Everything that you could imagine that could go wrong in his life went wrong in the natural, and he had a key. He had a key to life. He knew that the kingdom of God was righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's always been righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Before Jesus came, it was righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It just got uh, so that the Holy Spirit lived within you instead of coming down upon you in the New Testament. And um, so when you're lacking righteousness, peace, or joy in the Holy Spirit, you need a makeover. You need to get with God. You need to find the way of getting back to joy, getting back to peace, and getting back to righteousness, for that is the life that God has given you. The reason why Jesus died on the cross, it is your inheritance and your portion. It is not conditional upon the circumstances of your life. It is not conditional know whether you are in a time of war or in a time of peace, whether you're in a time of blessing or whether you're in a time of drought. It is not conditional upon circumstances. It is when you learn that this is your inheritance. Just because you're fighting a war doesn't mean you have to be dragged through the mud in your spirit. It doesn't mean just because you lose your job or your marriage is having real struggles or your kids are turning against you or the nation voted in the wrong way. It doesn't matter which of those things might have come against you. The greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And God has called you to be a person filled with his righteousness, his peace, and his joy in every country, in every situation, and in every place. That's your inheritance. How do you know if you've got it? Well, you go to the secret place. You cannot get this in the subway. You cannot get this in Times Square. You cannot get this when so much is running around. You can't test the waters properly. You got to get alone and you got to pull yourself aside. And there in that secret place, you got to get there with God. And there in that place, you got to open the windows toward Jerusalem and say, oh Lord, I want to give thanks to you. I want to see thanksgiving is uh, <clears throat> the test meter of whether you got 
righteousness, peace, and joy in your life. Can you still thank him? Can you still say, Lord, I want to thank you today? Yeah, they beat me. Yeah, they accused me. Yeah, they persecuted me. Yeah, they betrayed me. Yes, they rejected me. Yes, I felt like I was all alone. Yes, they stole from me. But Lord, I want to give thanks to you because there's no one like you. There's no one who watches over me. No one who keeps me like the God of Israel. No one who watches over me in the dark hours, who takes me through the valley of oppression, who leads me through the valley of darkness. There's no one like you. I give you thanks today for you are all I need. I thank you. And you start to be specific with the thanksgiving. And if you can thank the Lord like that in the worst of times, the devil won't be able to steal your joy. And he won't be able to steal your peace. And he won't be able to take away your righteousness. And he will not be able to lead you down the path to destruction. Daniel knew this secret. And immediately upon hearing that you got to worship this king or you're going to be thrown into the lion's den, it says he went home. He went to the upper room. He went to that place of prayer, opened his window, and he said, I want to see if I lost it, Lord. And he starts to race toward thanksgiving. He went to that, to that power source that he knew. And as he started to give thanks to the Lord, it just started to come. Whoa, it couldn't stop. I thank you, Lord. I wonder if he started to sing to a James Brown tune before James Brown was ever born. I wonder if he got something in his step where he started to thank the Lord. Because, you know, he's Jewish. And the Jewish people know how to dance. They know how to kick their legs up and make a move. They can twirl, and they can sing, and they can hallelujah. Every situation, I can just see him. He's not a stuffed shirt. This guy knows his God, and he starts giving thanks, and it is real. It is real, the thanksgiving. He's testing it. He's wanting to know, is this just words? Are these just religious words, or am I really thankful? And when he felt the reality of thankfulness, then he knew the joy was there, and the peace was there, and the righteousness was there. I wonder if you have this same experience. I am purposely putting you on the spot right now and asking you if greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Or are you just dragged through the mud? Or are you just beat up all the time? Are you just a person who's always without and you don't know how to overcome? And I'll tell you, you've got to learn the thanksgiving message. Get it into your spirit and start to thank the Lord and realize that that will release everything else that you need if you can truly and authentically open up your heart and give thanks repeatedly, continuously. It says, as he has been doing three times a day, he was giving thanks to the Lord. You need to know about this man, Daniel, because he was one of these young men that was brought by King Nebuchadnezzar. He saw the guys on this side get killed, executed, off their heads on this side as well. Somehow he still in chains was brought to that place. You know, Daniel outlived five kings in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Belshazzar, Darius, and Cyrus, and a king that's not mentioned in the Bible, but historians say he was there during the time of Daniel. Five kings. You know what his story was with every one of them? It says, and Daniel prospered in the time of King Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel prospered in the time of King Darius. I'm going to show you. Come on, let's, let's go for a journey here. First of all, we go uh, to Daniel chapter 4 and verse... Daniel chapter 4 and verse 34. You need to get this. It says in verse 34... At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. And my 
did this just, there we go. Uh, then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lived forever. This is the king. Because of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar is now starting to praise God because he had judgment on his life. I, we won't tell the story because it takes too long. And uh, then Nebuchadnezzar continues to say his dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases. He's talking about God with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back God's hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My adversary as noble sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven. Because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. So that's because of Daniel. That's because of this man who had the key of thanksgiving that kept him in the right place that this king, Nebuchadnezzar, who completely destroyed Jerusalem, is now praising the God of heaven. And then in chapter 5 it says, Then king... Belshazzar. So now we're, sh we're shifted to another king. And um, <clears throat> these are the words of Daniel to Belshazzar, verse 22 of chapter 5 of Daniel. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles and wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron, wooden stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds you in, the, holds you in his hand, your life, and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription, and in the inscription it says, that you have been weighed and found wanting in your kingdom. It says in verse 28, is divided against you and given to the Medes and Persians. And then Belshazzar commanded Daniel, was clothed in purple, in gold chain, was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of Babylonians, was slain. And Darius, the Mede, took over the kingdom at the age of 62. So that's king number two, who's now glorifying and blessing Daniel at the end of his reign and coming to ruin himself because of his sin. I want you to see the power of praise in the midst of the darkest situations. And then we look at King Darius. Chapter 6, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 governors, or satraps, uh, to rule throughout his communion his dominion, his kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel, right? And now it says in verse 3, Daniel distinguished himself, and he had ex uh, exceptional qualities, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And in verse 4 it says, At this the administrators and the governors, the satraps, tried to find grounds of charges against Daniel, uh, in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They found no corruption in him because he was trustworthy, and they found no neglect in him. Uh, finally, they said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless we find something to do with the law of his God. And so it's because of Daniel that these wise men come to the king, Darius, and say, Darius, you should, set, you should tell everybody that they can only worship you for a whole month. And if anybody worships any other god, let's throw him in the lion's den. And Darius thought it was a good idea, even though Daniel was his friend. He didn't know the details of Daniel's life. And he wasn't thinking about Daniel. And so he agreed to it, and they said, write it down as the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be reversed. And uh, then it says that this was published, that nobody could worship any other god uh, for a month except for King Darius. And when Daniel learned this decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room and opened the windows towards Jerusalem. And three times a day he got down on his knees and gave thanks and prayed just as he had done before. It says in verse 11, Then these men went as a group <clears throat> and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king 
and spoke to him about his royal decree. And so they threw Daniel in the lion's den. Now it sounds cute in storybooks, but lions tear you apart and rip your flesh and their tongue alone can lick the skin off your body. It's got a rasp in it. And their teeth uh, are four inches long. Uh, they're canines of a male a lion. And they can be an inch and a half thick at the base. And they are so powerful that they will just rip anything apart. Daniel gets lowered into uh, a kind of cave underground. And they said put a stone over it so it's perfectly dark under there. And there's a whole den of lions down in that place. He gets put in that place. But this is a man who, in this sense, he doesn't care. He has learned to give thanks when there seemed like there was nothing to give thanks for. Because of that, he had the joy of the Lord in his life. And he had the peace of God in his life. I wonder what kind of fight you will have to fight. I wonder what kind of thing you will have to endure. I wonder what kind of firing squad you will have to face. And I wonder if you will know how to give thanks to the Lord. When trouble comes, I'm telling you, make a race for thanksgiving. Make a race to give thanks to the Lord. You've got to. There's no other place. There's no other ground. There's no other weapon that you can start with. You can't fire a bullet. You can't rebuke even. You can't do anything until you get the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you. And where are you going to get it from unless you go to the throne room? But if you're a wounded spirit, you can't pray. If you're a wounded spirit, you can't hear from God. If you're a wounded spirit, it won't come out right. You've got to get yourself clean first. You've got to lay aside all the junk, all the stuff that the enemy throws against you, all the fears of Jezebel, all the dark things of witchcraft, all the, the evil words of men, all the, the attacks that are coming, all the fears that you see on CNN, all the dark stuff that's coming uh, against you from within and without, every kind of antichrist kind of spirit that comes against you. How in the world are you going to fight against that without, without failing, without, without falling to the ground and becoming completely weak unless you know the power of the living God and the Holy Spirit in your life and you've got to go to the secret place and you've got to open your hearts. Quit complaining and quit moaning and quit whinging and whining and quit making yourself a victim when you're a king's son, a king's daughter and greater is he who is in in you than he is in the world. So go to the high place. Go to the high place, servants of the Most High God, and start to give thanks to him. That's not where it ends. That's just where it starts. You start to give thanks. You enter his gates. Come on, you got to get to the courts. The courts of the king. You can't get to the courts unless you go through the gates. You can't get through the gates unless you enter with thanksgiving in your heart. Then you say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. And after a while, you start to think about what you're supposed to thank him for. And then you start to mention those things. And then the Holy Spirit will come on you. And you will get the prophetic words. And you will get the power words. And you will get the sword in your hand of fire to rebuke the devil. And to undo every force of darkness. But it starts with a race to the room of thanksgiving. So Daniel's thrown in the lion's den. And we come down to verse 24. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought, this is chapter 6, verse 24, were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and their children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language throughout the land, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed, and his dominion will never fail. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel 
prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So he prospers under Nebuchadnezzar, and he prospers under Belshazzar, and he prospers under Darius, and he prospers under Cyrus. What's stopping this guy? Nothing. But on the way, he is accused, he is berated, he is slandered, he is lied against, he is persecuted, he is thrown to the lions. Oh, hallelujah! This is yours. This is your inheritance. This, this is not for just super professional Christians. It is for the people of God. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And this is the power of the Holy Spirit for you. Because you have faced many battles. And you will face many more in the days ahead. It will not get easier because the people of the nations are turning away from God more and more. It's the reason why the book of Revelation will happen one day. Because people have gone to their own devices and to the darkness that's in the world. The Bible says, he came unto his own. He says, the light has shone in darkness, but the darkness did not understand it. And he came unto his own, but his own didn't receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power and the right to become the sons of the living God. Ha! Ah, to those who were born not by man, not by man's ideas, and not given permission by a husband, it says. But they were born of the Holy Spirit of God, and they rose up in power and authority. And it says to them, God has given his glory and his grace and his truth. The truth is, please say it with me, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. That's the truth. That's the truth. How are you going to access it? You have to get to the grace. Remember, Jesus came full of glory, grace, and truth. So first, just know the truth. Now you have to access the grace. You access the grace by going to the room of thanksgiving. That's where it starts. You enter his gates with thanksgiving. Then you enter his courts with praise. That's step number two, but that's for another day. So you enter his gates with thanksgiving. You get in there. You start to make sure it's real. You give him thanks. You give him thanks. And don't leave there. Keep giving thanks to him at least three times a day, all day long. Give him thanks. Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. Oh, yeah. And then it will lead you to the glory. And the glory is more than just a feeling of exhilaration. The glory of the Lord is the light of heaven that changes the world, that captivates kingdoms and makes the Nebuchadnezzars and the Darius of this world bend to his will, his kingdom, and his dominion. And God can use you, ladies, as he used an Esther. He can use you, gentlemen, as he used a Joseph and a Daniel. You are the people of God. There is no place so dark that God cannot move powerfully there. He will move in the United Arab Emirates. He will move in America. Do not think that in any way God is finished with this nation. Oh, no. But your place in it is determined by the Thanksgiving room. 
you got to make a race. You got to run there. You had a rough day and the people say, hey, you want to go out for a drink? And you say, no, I got to go for a different kind of drink. I got to go to the Thanksgiving room. I've had a rough day, but it's, it's going to end really well. I want you to know it's going to end really well because I'm going to the Thanksgiving room. And you go in there, you put on the white robes, get your prayer shawl. You start to pray and give thanks to the Lord. Whoa, Lord Jesus, King of Heaven. Whoa, I thank you. I thank you for making me part of your family. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the blood of the Lamb. I thank you that I am an overcomer. I thank you that there's no force in heaven or in hell that can stand against your power and your authority. I give you thanks, O Lord. Huh. So hold your hand up now. We're going to close. You're going to go and eat on this Thanksgiving day. This is not about niceties. And it's not just about survival. It's about your life and the glory of God and changing the nations. The starting key, the key to the first door is the key of Thanksgiving. Daniel went up there into that room three times a day. He gave thanks in the worst situations in the world. I want you to pray. Stand to your feet, please. Hold your hand out. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for saving me. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. I give you thanks for all the good gifts, for my life, for my breath, for my family, for this church. I give you thanks for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, for revelation and wisdom, and power for your comfort, for direction, for the weapons of warfare, for the fact that you have the victory in my life, and in my family, and for my children, and for my grandchildren, and for this nation, and for the whole world, for Israel, and for the darkest places. You are the King of glory. I give you glory. I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, if you want more prayer, I'm going to ask you to come up the front. I'm going to ask the ministry team to come. After I dismiss you, I'll meet the rest of you at the back there and uh, have something to give you. But right now, put your hand on your heart. Shh. Shh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ah. From Israel to the United Arab Emirates to Fort Mill, South Carolina, we release the blessing of the Lord over you, the power of the Holy One of Israel. I speak peace in your heart today, and I pull out every evil judgment, every wicked act of witchcraft against you. I break its authority, and I speak healing to your heart today. The melting away of the frozen junk of the devil. And I take the chains off your ankles. And the ropes off your feet. That you can fly. And you can sing. And you can dance. And you can be all that God has called you to be. I speak the year of God's favor over your life. And the thanksgiving room to be in your heart. Ha! <sighs> now I bless you. I speak the joy of the Lord in your heart. I speak the peace of God in your home and upon your marriage and your children and your children's children. And I speak blessings over the United States of America. I speak it now in the prayer of agreement in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Amen and God bless you.